Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We are proud that you're worshiping with us through our TV ministry, and we hope that you'll tune in often. First United Methodist Church is a wonderful church, and we're pleased that you're a part of it. Come and let us worship together. Welcome to the morning service of First United Methodist Church of Starkville, the church in the heart of the town with Christ in the heart of the church. Our weekly Sunday services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m., and our evening service is at 6 p.m. Join us now as we come together and exalt Jesus Christ our Lord. How good it is to uh, gather with you as we worship our Lord together as a community of faith. We're proud that you're here. We welcome you to First United Methodist Church. If you're a visitor, we give you a very warm welcome and uh, encourage you to come back and worship with us often and bring your friends along with you as well. We're very pleased to welcome the, the gentleman from uh, Phi Delta Theta and uh, any guests that they might have, we're pleased to have them. Let me encourage all of you, if you will, to register your attendance on the attendance pads that you find in the pew. If you'll register your attendance and pass it down so that others can do that. And then take the time before the service is over uh, to get to know your neighbor, speak to them, and, and learn who they are. <clears throat> Tonight we will uh, have a, a great opportunity for worship as uh, the brass ensemble and the performing handbells uh, will lead us, and that begins at 6 o'clock. And let me encourage you to be here, but also encourage you to bring a friend along with you. Uh, you'll not want to miss uh, those two groups. This Thursday, May the 3rd, is a National Day of Prayer. And on that day, um, our chapel will be open all the day, and we encourage you to come and pray for our nation and uh, also for our church and our community. Be aware that uh, next Sunday we will receive a special offering for our annual conference offering. Uh, this, as you're aware, is done each year. <clears throat> and this year the uh, offering will go to uh, ministries with children and youth, both in Zimbabwe and also in Mississippi. So we encourage you to come prepared to do that. This morning, as we worship, we light a candle to celebrate the, word, the birth of... Uh, Jill Pittman Andrews, who's the daughter of Bill and Stacy Andrews. And let me encourage you as we pray throughout this week, please remember Brian Hawkins and his family. His grandmother, Mrs. Ella Bray, passed away this week. Also, Libba Andrews uh, lost a favorite uncle, uh, Trooper Boyd, this week as well. So remember them as you pray this week. Would you please stand with me as we join in the call to worship? <coughs> To you, O Lord, we cry for help. From you, O Lord, comes help and healing. To you, O Lord, our praise ascends. From you, O Lord, comes joy in the morning. To you, O Lord, our soul gives thanks. To you, O Lord, we dance in joy. Let us pray together. O Holy God, we pray that you in the form of the resurrected Jesus will come and be among us as we worship this day. May each of us recognize the presence of our Lord and make him a part of our daily lives. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought, is numbered 128 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas numbered 128.
As you remain standing, please join with me in the historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence shall come the judge, the quick, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. together. O oh God of all certainty, we admit this morning that we sometimes have our doubts. We sometimes doubt your strength to help us face the temptations that the world offers us. And Lord, sometimes we even doubt that the love that you put in each one of us can bring peace to our community and to our world. And Lord, sometimes we doubt, too, your belief in us that we can grow to be generous people, that we can truly take care of the needs of people in our community and in our world. Forgive us, O oh Lord, of, of all the doubts that we have, all the times that we doubt you and the times that we doubt ourselves. And we pray, Father, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might have the confidence to be the people that you want us to be the people that you enable us to be, the people that you call us to be. And Lord, help us always to be the witnesses that we know that we should be throughout our whole earth, in our homes, in our communities, in our state, in our nation, in our world. Forgive us, O oh God, when we fail. And now with the confidence of little children, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for Miss Jane to meet the children down front. Oh. All right, you know, let's leave this open. I need to leave a place open right here. Okay, Sanders, move over just a little bit closer to Evelyn. Georgia Grace, would you move over just a little bit? I need to leave this, this pathway right here open, okay? Now, all right, let's leave this open right here. Aubrey, you can come sit up here if you want to. Come, come up here. Let's, I, I need to leave, yeah, just a path right here open. All right, Maddie, come sit over here by me, would you? And Clay, I want you to go out there and stand. All right, now, I need you to move over just a little bit, okay? All right, now, I want, we're going to play tug of war. Where'd Maddie go? Maddie, come sit right here. I want you to help me. All right, Clay, I want you to take this end. All right, you sit right here. Or you, can, you may stand up, that's right. Now, just stand up. Now, you and Clay are going to play tug of war. Now, we're, we're gonna kinda tone it down a little bit since we're inside, okay? All right, now, if the, if the 
loop and the rope goes past the first bench, Clay wins the round, and when the loop and the rope comes past Evelyn, Maddie wins the round, all right? Would you mind helping me do this? Would you help me? Would you rather I get somebody else? Mason, you want to help? Come here. That's all right. Come here. All right, now. All right, I'm going to say go. And remember, we're inside, so turn it down a little bit, okay? <laughs> on your mark, and Mason, you hold on to the rope really tight, okay? On your mark, get set, go. Oh, I believe Clay won that round. Okay, let's back up again. All right, back up over here, Mason. Now, we're going to try another round. All right, Mason, you got it? All right, now, on your mark, let go of that loop so it won't get your finger. I know you know it again. I don't know. Let's see. On your mark, get set, go. <laughs> Who won that time? Thank you, Clay. You're a great sport. Have a seat. Now, we didn't do that just so I could bully you all around down here, okay? Did that to make a point. I'm bigger and stronger than any of you, so whoever's on my side is gonna win that game, Me. right? That's right. <laughs> but here's the point. Follow me on this one. God is bigger and stronger and more powerful than anything in this whole universe, isn't he? He can carry the whole world. He sure can. That means God is always going to win. Sometimes it doesn't look like it to us that God's winning, and it doesn't feel like God's winning. And sometimes when we need help and we ask God to help us, He doesn't always help us like we think He should or as fast as we think He should work. But, he, but He's there. And we, sometimes sad things happen and we don't understand. And He doesn't always make the sad and the bad things go away. But we can count on God's promise that He will never leave us. He will comfort us and give us His strength and His peace anytime we ask for it. Now, I think I want to be on God's side as I go through my life. What about you? Let's pray. Thank you, God. Strong, powerful, loving God. Thank you for giving us your strength, your peace, and your comfort in any situation. We want to be on your side, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We don't have to I offer him you. this morning, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, is numbered 136 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas, and let us stand, please, as we sing.
pray. Oh God in heaven, we come this morning very much aware of all that you give to us. Now, God, may we give to you and to this ministry that we have the privilege of sharing together. And God, as we pool our resources, let us pool our prayers and our service so that we might serve you with all that's within us. For this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. This morning our scripture comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hand. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne 
and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Adrienne and choir. Always, always beautiful music. You know, I've been thinking this week about uh, comic strips. And I'm convinced that writing a cartoon strip or a comic strip week after week is, is probably just about as challenging as, as writing a sermon and delivering it week after week. Um, sometimes it can be quite a challenge, but uh, there are some cartoonists over the years that I think have done very well. They've managed to keep my attention. And I noticed that uh, since uh, 1968, Tom Wilson and then later his son, Tom Wilson II, have managed to, to make the, the cartoon Ziggy. 
Ziggy, one of my favorites. It might be one of your favorites as well. And sometime back, I opened up the Sunday paper and I pulled out the comic section uh, to read a little theology. You may not be aware, but you can find theology all through the funny papers, all through the comic strips, and that's basically what I was doing. And there was a, a Ziggy cartoon strip. And it showed Ziggy out in the open ski country, and, and oddly enough, he was carrying a book along with him, and his little dog Fuzz was with him as well. And, and Ziggy is, is saying to Fuzz, says, Fuzz, we won't get lost hiking in the woods this time, as though to insinuate that maybe they had been lost before. And his words continues, because I brought this cross-country ski trail guidebook with me. And then there's a puzzled look on Ziggy's face, and, and he says, As a matter of fact, Fuzz, this area here looks none too familiar. I'd better consult the guide. And he did, and he said, See, there are three ways of finding our way home. Then he said, uh, First, there is the coin flip method. I think I'll skip that one, he says. Two is the any, many, money, mo method. Oh, uh, that doesn't sound so good either, he said. Ah, here we go, here we go. Three is the auditory method. Sounds impressive, doesn't it, Fuzz? Let's see. Let's see what it says to do. A, get comfortable. B, take a deep breath. C, yell, help, as loud as you can. Well, it, it really doesn't take a silly cartoon character, by the way, one who doesn't wear pants. Have you noticed that about Ziggy? Since 1968, he's never worn pants. Go back and look. I, I challenge you to do that. But it doesn't take a, a silly cartoon character to remind us that, that many times when we get into trouble, when we're having difficulty, we very quickly move through all the, our options, and then in one way or another, one way or another, we yell as loud as we can, help me, God, help me, God. Because, you see, when we're facing difficult times, and when we need help, sometimes even the, the best intentions don't help. Sometimes even the members of our family or our very closest friends, they cannot help us. They cannot help us. They can't find, help us find our way out of the wilderness that, that we find ourselves in sometimes. It, it seems that try as they might, they just can't scratch where we itch. They can't help us in our situation. Now, they mean well, they really do. And, and you know of folks who mean well, who, who try to help, but they just don't help very much. They're, they're just uh, some hurts that no one, no human being can help us with. No one. But some people try, don't they? They, they really try. Bless their hearts. You know that saying, bless their hearts, they really try. They mean well, they try, but sometimes the harder they try, it seems the worse it gets. It seems the worse that the situation gets. I read a story years ago in Field and Stream magazine, and it stuck with me all these years. There were two men who were out hunting, and they were headed home late at night, and yes, they had been drinking a little. And suddenly, a dog ran out in front of their vehicle, and they, they hit it rather hard. And as they traveled on down the road, they began to think about it. And one of them said, you know, if that was my dog, I'd sure wish somebody would stop and help it and take care of it. The other one said, yeah, you're right. So they turned around, and they went back to see if, if there was anything that they could do for the injured dog. Well, they found it on the side of the road, unconscious. And so they decided they would take it to a vet, and they put it in the back seat of the car, and off they went to look for a vet. However, as they drove toward the next town, the dog revived. 
and it began to attack them. And, and, and they were able to fight it off, but the one that was not doing the driving finally had to sit a straddle of the dog to keep it from hurting them. But they reasoned, poor thing, poor thing. It's so confused that it doesn't even know that we're trying to help it, that we're, we're looking for a vet. We're trying to help it out. Well, they had to stop for directions, and they finally found a vet's house. And because it was so late, they had to get him out of bed, of course. And when he came to the door, there the two men stood with, with the dog in their hands, and, and they pleaded. They said, Sir, can you please help us with this dog? We hit it with our car, and it's all banged up. Could you please help? And the vet gave them a long and a very puzzled look and said, Well, yes, I, I can, but... Why do you want to spend your money on a coyote? <laughs> some days and some situations are just like that, aren't they? They're just like that. They're, they're many, many good people with very good intentions. They really want to help, but sometimes they just don't get it right. They don't get it right. And my friends, there are some hurts that only God can heal. And there are some burdens that only God can lift. And there are some fears that, that only God can, can put to rest. So it's with great joy that I remind you of the good news in our scripture today. In the last verse of the scriptures that we read together, we learn that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and that should be good news for every one of us. Good news for each of us. God hears us when we cry, help me, God, help me. And God can help us. The God of all creation, the God of the heavens and the earth, the God of everything that moves and breathes, that God, that God cares about our hurts. That God cares about our needs. And God hears us. When we cry out, help me, God, help me. The promise is that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Every tear from our eyes. What a promise that is. Think about it. What a promise that is. Now, let's face it, my friends. Life is sometimes very, very hard. It's very, very hard. We, we don't know, always understand why life can be so hard, but we know that if we live long enough, we discover that, that there's, there's bumps in the road in life. There's difficulties in life. And sometimes we, we find ourselves wondering, does anyone care? Does anyone care when, when life is so hard for me? Does anyone care when, when I'm crying my eyes out? Does anyone care? Well, the, the answer to that is, oh, yes. God cares. God cares. He cares for us through his, his resurrected son, Jesus Christ. That's how God cares for us. Back years ago, Frank Graff uh, made that great discovery. He was going through some very difficult times in his life. And, and back in 1901, while he was going through depression and doubt and, and physical pain as well, he wrote the song, Does Jesus Care? And we've sung that song for years, Does Jesus Care? And that song, you'll notice, is, is chock full of questions. Maybe questions that would cross our lips when we're in that position of crying out, Help me, God. Help me. I don't know anyone else to turn to. Help me, God. Do you remember the song? Do you remember some of the phrases in that song? Just listen to the words. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear as the daylight fades into deep night shades? Does he care enough to be near does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When my deep grief, there is no relief through my tears, though my tears flow all the night long. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me 
and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him? Does he see? You see, that, that song has so many questions, hard questions, real questions, valid questions, but my friends, that song also has answers. Do you remember the answers? It says, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? God cares through the resurrected Jesus Christ. God cares. God cares for us in a very personal, a very intimate way. That's good news. That's good news. Notice the, the beautiful, beautiful word picture that is painted here. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Just like a mother holding her child and, and giving it comfort and giving it love. And you remember that, that Jesus taught his, his followers to pray Abba, meaning father, or maybe more definitely uh, meaning daddy. Can you get any more personal than that? I, I think not. The God of the Bible, my friends, is powerful and mighty, but that same God, that very same God, also has the tender heart of a loving father or a loving mother. Can you think of something more wonderful than that? William Henson, in his book, Living in a Shattered World, tells about a man from England, a man by the name of Sutherland, whose story was written about some years ago in Time magazine. Mr. Sutherland had one son, and he went off to battle in World War II and ended up being listed as missing in action. There never was any other word from that son, just missing in action. So Mr. Sutherland was alone in the world, and, and he nourished the hope, though, that somewhere, somehow, that son was still alive and that son would return to him. And, and one Easter Sunday morning, he was crossing a, a busy intersection on his way to church, and he saw a familiar face in that crowd. It, that, that person was walking through the intersection with a whole bunch of other people, and he thought it might be his son. Their eyes met briefly, and, and then the man that he thought might be his son turned and, and walked away, and he was quickly lost in the huge crowd. But Mr. Sutherland was convinced that his son was alive that maybe he had amnesia, maybe he didn't remember his past. So he withdrew all of his life savings and, and he began spending all of his time traveling over the country and, and posting pictures of his son and leaving his own name and address in hopes that he'd find his son. And every Easter Sunday morning, he stood at that same intersection, searching every face in hope that that he would find his son. And he had done that for 10 years when that story in Time magazine was written. Now there's a great deal of sadness in that story, but there's also a lot of love. There's also a lot of love, the love that, that maybe only a parent can understand. And the Bible tells us that God's love even exceeds the love of a father or a mother one who will wipe away every tear, every tear from our eyes. You just can't get any more intimate, any more personal than that. But it's very important that, that we notice something this morning. Our scripture tells us that God's love, God's great love, God's intimate love is being expressed to a very special group of believers to a very special group of believers. God's love was being expressed in our scripture today to those who had come through the, the, the great ordeal or the great uh, tribulation when there was much suffering for the name of Christ. And these are the ones whose robes had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And now they're all dressed in white and they're standing before the throne of God. <coughs> and God is personally wiping away every tear, every tear from their eyes. It's important, it's important that we understand that God's promises are to a special group 
a people. Because you see, many of us in this day and time, we have a, a rather mushy kind of faith, don't we? A mushy kind of faith that says something like, well, everything's going to be all right. Jesus loves me like the song says. Jesus loves me, this I know. So it really doesn't matter what I do with my life. Jesus will always forgive me. Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that? Don't you get sucked in into believing that? The secular world tells us that over and over and over away, uh, over each and every day, and, and in, a, in a jillion different ways. Those who wish that it was that way, regardless of how they live their lives, they dreamingly tell us that over and over again. One day when I was about 13, my friend Billy Wayne and I were fishing on a creek bank. And, well, the catching was a little slow, but the sun was warm and inviting. I suppose you could say it was kind of a Tom Sawyer, maybe a Huck Finn kind of day. It was just one of those days. And, and so we just lay down on the creek bank, and, and before we knew it, we had begun theologizing. You know, when we really had no business theologizing. You see, Billy Wayne never went to church. And at that point in my life, I did not attend church. And our robes were far from being white. I'll tell you that. So you might say we had no business theologizing. Talking about how God works in our world and how God works in our lives. But... We did that day there on the creek bank. It, it all began when, when Bill Wayne asked, Danny, do you believe that there is a hell? And I thought about that for a while, and I said, no, I, I really don't. And I think that surprised Bill Wayne a little because he asked me, so why don't you believe that there is a hell? And I had a good answer. I, I said, well, if, if God loved everybody enough to send Jesus, then he probably loves them enough that he wouldn't let them go to hell. Little did I know. Little did I know. Little did I understand. But it sounded good, didn't it? It sounded good. And, and my friends, if you're 13, or if you're 18, or if you're 23, or 28, or 98, if, if you're that way, if you're whatever age, and not living the life that you know that you should be living, you can make almost anything sound good, can't you? You can make almost anything sound good. I've learned better since then. And, and along the, that line of thinking, a real theologian, a real theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, back during the, the days of World War II, he challenged the church, and he challenged those of us who make up the church not to dispense what he called cheap grace. Cheap grace. Let me assure you, friends, there is nothing cheap about God's grace. There's nothing cheap about God's grace and about God's love. Don't you remember Good Friday? Don't you remember the cross? The love and concern that, that God offers to us has been bought, has been bought at a terribly high price. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, and, and, and it is, therefore, not to be trampled upon or even taken for granted like we do from time to time. But in our day and time, we're so often like that little boy who one day said to his father, Dad, let's play darts. I'll throw the darts, and you say, wonderful, wonderful. Isn't that the way we want God to be sometimes? God, tell us how wonderful we are. Church, tell us how great we are. God, tell us how lucky you are to have us. Church, tell us how lucky that, that, that you are to have us sitting in the pews. Tell us that we're loved and accepted, but don't tell us that our robes are dirty. Don't tell us that, and don't tell us that we need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. My friends, God's love is all-inclusive. God's love is inexhaustible. God's love is everlasting. But if we are to experience that love, we must be open to him, and we must experience and accept his son, 
the resurrected Lord, the resurrected Jesus. We must be doing our part to, to maintain the relationship. Even with a loving God, love is a two-way street. Love is a two-way street. We must seek to, to give our best because we know that God always gives us his best. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Those are wonderful words, but they're directed at a faithful group, those who are faithful to God, those who accept his son, Jesus. God loves us. We know that. But my friends, what are we to do in response to that love? What are we to do in response to the love that, that God extends to us in an intimate and personal way? <clears throat> in his book, Trying to Give Yourself Away, David Dunn tells about a young woman who was in a train station in, in the lobby in Cincinnati. And she looked to be about 15 years old. And at first she was sitting over in the corner of the station, but, but there was a woman that came along. She had two small children and and, and uh, several packages, and the teenage girl walked over and, and, and uh, asked the woman, may I take care of your children while you go get something to eat? You look a little tired, and the next train isn't due for a good while, so why don't you let me help you? I'm very good with children, she said. And, and that mother said, oh, thank you, that would be wonderful. And so she went on her way. She left the children with the young lady. And a little later, the mother returned, and she seemed to be more relaxed and more refreshed. And she thanked that young lady profusely. <coughs> well, the train came, and the teenage girl helped the mother on the train with her children and with all of her baggage. <coughs> and then she turned, and she sat back down. It wasn't long before another mother came along, and she too had children and packages. And again, the young lady went over and offered to help, and the mother accepted gladly. And soon that young lady helped that mother and her children and her bags on the train. <coughs> and then she sat back down. And there was a man in that station watching everything that was going on, and he walked over and, and said, Pardon me, but I've been watching you helping these mothers with her children, and I wonder, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And she said, oh, I was one of five children, and my dad was in the Army, so we were always moving from place to place, and my mother got so tired carrying all of those suitcases and all the children, all the packages, and I remember her saying to me, you are so good with the children. And she continued, my dad went to the war and never came back. So that left my mom alone, and she died recently, so I thought maybe I could do something for others in her memory because she said I was so good with kids. And I thought it, there might be a lot of mothers in this train station, so that's why I come here often to this place. It makes me feel good doing it for her. It really helps. Now, isn't that a refreshing story? Isn't it a refreshing story? Doesn't it make you want to go out and do something for someone else? Well, my friends, that's our response to God's love. God loves us. We, in turn, should respond with love to other people as well. God's love is, is very intimate. It's very personal. But for love to work best, it always has to be a two-way street. In fact, love at its very best is, is not only between God and us, but it's also a love that we can share with all of God's children who have tears in their eyes, too. To share with all of God's children who have tears in their eyes, too. Help me, God. Help me, God. And God, help me to help others. Help me to help others. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 138, The King of Love My Shepherd Is. And as we sing this hymn of invitation together, to, together I, I challenge you to do as God leads you to do. You may be here 
and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord, you've never accepted that love so that it's more difficult for you to share it with others. I challenge you to accept that love today. You may like to be a part of our fellowship where we think that we're a loving fellowship. We, we are a loving fellowship and we share that love. We, we challenge you to come and be a part of our ministry, but most especially, I challenge you, do what God leads you to do as we stand and sing together. My friends, let us remember, if God is our shepherd and loves us, we in turn must shepherd others and love them. Go and do likewise in the name of Jesus.